Washington for about 20 years. He was the medical program director in Sonoma County here in Washington State from 2005 through, through 2012. Um, and during that time, and still currently, is the MPD for Sonoma County Volunteer Search and Rescue. He's currently the president of North Sound uh, Emergency Physicians Group, and he's also the EMS director at Everett, Marysville, District 7, and Goldwater Fire Department. So the plan is that Ron's going to talk, do a presentation for about 45, 50 minutes, and leave some time at the end for questions, so taking no more than an hour. But if you do have questions, Ron is fine with interrupting or raising your hand, and he'll take them as we go. Okay? All right? Take it away, Ron. All right. Um, and I will try to get through this quickly. I tend to get a little windy sometimes. <laughs> I have miles to go. You guys can just kind of speed it up here. But, um, of you were around in Washington two years ago. So, um, I was in an uh, emergency or an EMS conference in Leavenworth, Washington. When someone told me that there had been a landslide in Leavenworth. There's landslides all the time, and then you know, these things kind of roll roll out in, in ways that they don't roll out like a typical EMS type call. Someone called 911, three people have been shot, police, fire show up. There. Disasters roll out a little bit more gradually in the scope of what's going on. It's kind of assessed by authorities, etc. So, um, at the beginning, I'm just going to talk a little bit about the event itself and some of the timelines. Um, so, there's uh, a river that runs through the northern part of Snohomish County, uh, east and west, called the Snohomish River. And like rivers in western Washington, it constantly is changing its banks. Most of western Washington is all glacial fields kind of like gravel and sand with some clay mixed in, and so it's not very stable, and it slides a lot. Um, since the 1960s, in this one section here, there's a, a development. These are all plats in the development that was called Steelhead Haven. Um, and there are probably around 40, 40 to 50 homes in here, um, including one of our nurses from Providence was home when it was a rainy weekend, and then on Saturday, suddenly a large area gave way. Most slides in western Washington aren't that big of a deal. They're more like slumps. Uh, this one was more like a lahar. So that volcano erupts, uh, melts a bunch of ice, and mixes with this glacial till type stuff, and then it turns into a wet cement type of river that can go very fast speed well over highway speeds. So in the purple area here, you can see this is where the slump was. This is pre-slump pre here, obviously, because you've got all the trees, et cetera. And you can see this here, right? This is logging. So that's where a lot of the litigation is focused on now. That they have something to do with it. Um, the source of the slide was this bank up here. It slumped once, and then it liquefied, and then it took off across the river and actually went up the other side of the valley before kind of washing back down and swept all those homes with it. So the USGS noted on their seismographs that there was that initial large slump uh, followed by a brief pause and then complete liquefaction. And you can see that this is the actual slide, which took about 90 seconds for everything to get across the valley. So there's no way that anyone could escape it at all. Um, they did a, a quick. simulation on their computers, and you see, boom, that's across the valley. went right across the state route, 530, um, where there was actually uh, an automobile on that at the time, too. So. What time of day was that? It was, at, I believe, 1040 in the morning. So a lot of, it was on a Saturday, so there were a lot of people were home that would have been at work. Uh, children were home that would have been in school also. So this is the, the um, pre-slump area, and here's Steelhead Haven right here, and this is post. You can see this hillside right there gave away right into that, completely took out the river. You can see the, the river just disappeared there. But this is a hill, kind of a knob, so it, it went on either side of it, and the bulk of the people, their pets, animals, and possessions, and they washed up here, washed up. So um, this is another photo, just kind of looking, looking west. This is actually 
Anyway, the, all these trees were way up at the top, way up here, so they slumped down. The soil underneath them got liquefied and then shot across the valley there. So again, that's something really unusual. You can see all these hillocks. That's the, the fluid dynamics of this, of this um, soil and water. It just kind of flowed up and down like that. Once it stopped flowing, then it settled, just like an avalanche does. Same type of fluid dynamics that the Over. This is just some timeline stuff. Snowhawk 10, so that's our search and rescue helicopter from Snohomish County. Um, they were actually spinning up at about 10 o'clock in the morning, 10.30, somewhere around there, to go on a training flight. Okay. And someone came out and said, hold on, gave this news. So they, they keep spinning up and they flew out over. So they were there. This happened around 10.40 in the morning. They arrived at 11.28 and immediately began rescue. So all of the rescue was done that day. So the last person that was rescued was at 4.30 in the evening. No one else was rescued after that. No one, no one else survived it. So the first two were women that were uninjured. They managed to, like, uh, in an avalanche again, if you could float on top of one of those, those uh, water wing type things, what do you call those? Yeah. Um, you know, they strive that way relatively unscathed. So we brought them out what's called a screamer suit. So it's a like, ladybug carapace that they would sit in. We hoisted them out. Did a low hover to take uh, two males. One of them was a child. And another was not a victim, but actually uh, a neighbor. They, they, all the neighbors and the fire and they immediately converged on this scene to try to save people. And then uh, they immediately would drop those people off on a road on the other side of the um, slide and then say, okay, the fire department will be here shortly and then they go back and get someone else. Brought this lady out who had multiple long bone fractures. Um, the fire department was extracting her from her house, the local fire department was, including the fire chief uh, himself, and that was, that was just a mess. About this time, the Navy search and rescue helicopter arrived. So this is different from Airlift Northwest. We used, and you'll see in the next slide, Airlift Northwest quite extensively. We would take the patients, we had to extricate them from this scene, which was a mess of a scene, really a dangerous scene. Put them someplace else, turn them over to fire to get the Airlift Northwest, and then in a knee-jerk reaction in the you know, Airlift Northwest, they don't hear differently, they're going to take all the patients out to Harbor Beach. In hindsight, probably one patient really needed to be a Harbor Beach, you need a lot of surgeries, etc. Um, so that was something that, that you know, we worked on from EMS Medical Director type standpoint. So the search and rescue, though, they're, they're useful. So they've got people that will go down on the ground and help uh, extricate people, put them in a litter, get them up and out. We did a joint rescue on an uh, older guy, 80-something years old, with some deep loving type injuries to, uh, to his upper extremity. And uh, we brought out our second kind of command helicopter, search helicopter. It's a small bird, a little bird. And so now we were stacking assets in the air. There were obviously assets on the ground, this is kind of air ops. At least initially, my involvement in this is, is with air ops. Um, on the ground, it was all fire department at this point. Um, they had sent out kind of an all-county page for help. Um, the units were en route, but they didn't get there until about this point. Uh, but these guys can use a thermal search to look for people, <clears throat> and they provided command and control until state patrol could get there with a fixed-wing aircraft make a no-fly zone, and uh, help make sure that no helicopters crashed into each other. Uh, so early on, fire requested airlift northwest, and they sent uh, all four of their birds. Um, there were two ways that this was being attacked, one from the west, which is um, the way most of us got there, because you come up by 5 and you go off 530, and then east, or Darrington, they're all by themselves, they're a BLS agency, Got one dock in town, and uh, I didn't even know if he was around. Um, and so they were kind of on their own. Uh, but we sent out one airlift to that side and one to the other side. And then they started taking these patients as part of one to Harbor View, many of the Alpha Zone, which is on the, on the east side, one to Harbor View, left Harbor View, came back, go to Harbor View, Harbor View, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So they were shuttling these patients out as fast as possible. So this is a Snowhawk 10. Um, 
search and rescue for Snohomish County actually doing a hoist off. Uh, these patients usually were extricated out of the mud. Um, firefighters a lot of times were standing up to their hips or armpits in this mud. It's very difficult. Some of the, we had to actually rescue some of that. They get them out, and you can see down here this, this little blurb down here. It's a collection of people who got to be hoisted out as one of our rescue techs down there. Well, I'm married to my friend. Fire, fire, this little, I don't know if you can see this little ladybug thing there, but that's the screamers. So that the, the basic tenet here is to try to get people out of this area as quickly as possible. This hillside was assumedly unstable, and over the next several days, we had more than one. Thanks for being on time. Now. <laughs> so um, we had more than one uh, episode of everybody being pulled out of the area because the geologists thought that they were starting to slide again, slump again. Uh, and this was an unusual slide from the geology standpoint. Like I said, usually they're just slumped. You guys have seen those. Have you ever been hiking around in our mountains? We've seen lots of those, particularly near rivers. This was really unusual. So we needed to get people out of there. So the easiest way you could get them out is the easiest way you could get them out. If they went out in the litter, that means they were bad hurt. So they had broken bones, a pelvic fracture. They got no kind of triage, basically. Everyone that was on the ground with these people were all ENT levels. There weren't any paramedics available for, for these rescues. So this was straight up extraction and you know, just try to save their lives by getting this is on the east side, so the river's over this way, SR 530's over here. This is one of those horns with this knoll that I told you guys about. And we had this big open field that hadn't been flooded yet. Remember, the steel of Wallace is piling up against that slide and starting to flood this area, but it hadn't gotten here yet, so we call this LZ Alpha. Uh, this is the Navy search and rescue big NAS helicopter there, um, one of the airlift birds there. So this is where the transfer would, would take place between us, maybe, between the search and rescue people and the uh, airlift people. This is on the east side. So this is what I saw right here. I looked over on this road and I see this house sitting there. Um, it's less crunched looking than it appears here if you're looking down on it, but it was still kind of a weird scene. So I had driven this area many, many times. Uh, this was taken from Snowhawk 10, and the debris all went that way. Um, but there were a lot of bodies kind of in this, this area. And then, while this is all happening, that river is March, right? So we've got snow melt and we have rain, and it's all piling up. So the National Weather Service actually issued a flash flood warning for the next week or so, sat or, um, west along the valley all the way to Arlington. This is building up against the dam, and it was our rivers, they're not going to stop. They're not going to create a big lake. They're going to find their way through. And if it broke down and went through, then it was going to take out several neighborhoods in the Arlington area, which is a city of about 4,000 people, I guess, 5,000 people. So, um, you know, that was something else to worry about. This is also complicated getting to the scene for those people, those rescuers on the east side, the Darrington side. So they used a lot of hovercraft in these, these areas. And they actually had to do a lot of searching for, for recovery in water like this. Um, and it was actually not until it actually its way through and the waters went down that we were able to recover the last of the people. So this is Snowhawk 10 doing point stops rescue. You can get kind of an idea from this low shot just what a nasty mess this was. It's not just mud and water, right? This swept through a housing development. Now it's a rural housing development, sure. So that's got its pluses and its minuses. People that live out in the, in the sticks will have I think it's fair to speculate more barrels of whatever we don't know. In addition to they're all on septic. So think about your garage, your parents' garage. There's stuff in my garage. I don't know what it is. Right? All that stuff got swept out, broken open, and mixed with this mud and water, including the septic systems. So that was the initial toxic nastiness. And then it just got worse from there as all the little critters and people started decomposing. But it, this is this is a treacherous mess. You step on some of these logs, you break a leg. You go right down between it into this quicksand type stuff. And these firefighters who all live here, they're all volunteer firefighters, and you know they knew these people. In addition to neighbors, etc., they all just piled into this mud to try to, to get these people out. I have a couple videos, um, but I don't have them here. There's some privacy stuff and things like that, but they're very illustrative of um, how difficult was to get people out and we'd be hoisting people up and we're waist deep in the, the mud and 
et cetera, and actually with this compliant behavior. So this is one of the birds of the two males, a little four-year-old boy. Um, he got handed up to uh, this rescue tech who was stepping down, who just stepped off of what we call low hover, stepped off to the top of this kind of one of those hillocks. It wasn't quite so high. He only sank up to about here. And a um, civilian handed it to him, and then we had to pull the civilian out. And then two firefighters and one other civilian um, were also helping them went off to look at more houses. And this is what I was telling you. These are the two females that were first taken off. Literally, at this point, because Snohawk County kind of got there so quick, all the local fire agencies were already in the pile, in the mud field. And the rest of the county had really, it was just piecemeal arriving that we literally kind of dropped them off on Wellington's that one said, you know, you don't look, you're not going to die. You don't want to be here. So, not ideal, but you know, that's what we have to do in situations like this. So, after 9-11, the federal government looked at what a mess that was um, and came up with the incident command system, which is actually useful. Um, it's very bureaucratic, um, but it is actually useful because it, this is a mess of the scene. You've got all these different agencies. You've got police, fire. Um, you know, hospitals involved, and then it expands from there as you bring in public works and federal government take over and things like that. So this incident command system is to try to bring some order out of the chaos. These incident commands, though, they take time to develop also. Now, they set up, fire sets up an incident command every time they arrive on scene of anything. A car wreck, a house fire, what, you know, not a heart attack or something like that, but anything that, where there is patients slash people, plus other stuff involved, they set up incident command. In a situation like this, it's, it's unified command, so you'll have the search and rescue deputy on the east side of Darrington, and the Darrington fire chief, um, and he spent a lot of his first day in the hovercraft. Now on the west side, initially it was Neil, a friend of mine, a friend since then. Um, but he was out in the field, so these guys are completely hands on, all hands on deck. There were no volunteers that were able to step back and say, how can we coordinate this? So that's what Snowhawk 1 helped to do until the next fire agency over, um, it was more towards Arlington, was able to, the black fire chief came out, he's also one of our pilots, and he set up an incident command post. And this is where you can kind of try to direct your rescue or direct assets to the rescue and things like that. Um, at this time, of course, you know, the call had gone out to the rest of the county and even beyond saying, we need help. We have uh, three technical rescue teams um, in Snohomish County, all, they're all professional firefighters. Um, and usually they get paged out in one, one team or something like that. All three of the teams got paged out, suited up, headed in. We had multiple ALS and VLS transport units besides fire engines, etc., to try to just bring hands. And actually we had immediately urban search and rescue from Pierce County got in their rig. And this is before we even got a command post set up and asked for DEM on the state level to come and help, et cetera. Those guys, they got to slowly kind of set things up, too. So while that's all winding up, uh, this, this whole thing is happening all in day one. Snohomish County Department of Emergency Management sets up an EOC in Everett because that's where their headquarters is. Even though it's 30 minutes away from the scene, they've got to start bringing these assets in some kind of the same way. Because in addition to trying to, to still rescue people, remember the rescues are being done by two search and rescue helicopters and a bunch of people waiting through mud. So what you're trying to do is to, to bring assets and also make sure your people are safe out there. Right? Think back to the way I described that, that flow pilot, and mud pilot is incredibly dangerous for the rescuers themselves. So they put form what's called a type three incident uh, management team. Um, and then, so that's generally one that's the lowest level where DEM actually gets involved. So what that means is we start to organize it in branches. So we'll go into it, but you know we've got an air branch, obviously, that was uh, already going on, and that was Snohomish County Air Ops is doing that. We had a medical branch, which was fire, um, two medical branches, actually, one east side, one west side. Operations was the search or the uh, technical rescue teams for the fire department, and then logistics was handled by a team near themselves. So Local fire, EMS, doing medical completely. Um, you know, I didn't even show up on scene until day two. I think it was Sunday afternoon, I guess, day two. 
Uh, you know, so, but they didn't really need a doctor at that point. They need a doctor to help pull someone out of the mud, no matter how badly they're hurt, right? They didn't contribute anything to that. So, um, uh, right, well, I already went through that. So, this is a, a west side or an east side uh, type rescue. They had to use this a lot because of the uh, flooding that was occurring very rapidly from the Stillaguamish River. So, it's a, a firefighter from District 19 had to drive all the way around into Skagit County and then come down to Darrington. SR-530 is how you get to Darrington, Arlington. Um, and then these gentlemen, I think, were from the search and rescue zone. That's our swift water team. So, obviously then, this is a big deal. We, we don't know how many people are still trapped. A lot of the structures are semi-intact. And fire was going in a methodical way and cutting into the roofs of these structures to try to look for people. You don't call it a recovery on day one. So we know it went through a, a community. It could be 50, 60, 70, 100 people. We don't know. Just we don't know. So we start transitioning up to a higher level, a type 2. And this is where we can start to get state DNR and uh, FEMA people to come help. This is not like a big staff reacting thing that comes later. But they do start providing some logistical support, uh, getting assets, because clearly you don't just need hovercrafts, helicopters, and fire engines. Fire engines don't Anything. What do you need beyond this? You need excavators, big heavy equipment to, to try to dig through stuff, look for people, and then later to look for bodies. Um, as I said, Pierce County sent up, sent, came up with their big ass truck there really early. You wouldn't think USAR, which is Urban Search and Rescue, would be that useful, but it was. Why is it useful? Because these houses weren't all pancaked. A lot of them were, but not all of them. So these firefighters. Um, and these guys didn't do, obviously didn't do it themselves. Our, all of our technical rescue guys from Sonoma County Fire Department were cutting into these unstable structures and crawling inside. They were filled up with gunk and filled up with mud, et cetera, looking for people. King County then sent their PUEs starting one and two. At that time, they weren't medical. Um, and then the, uh, um, the state uh, calls out the Air National Guard. So they have a kind of, it's kind of a USAR type thing, extraction. <clears throat> they were the first National Guard to show up. Those guys were super useful. Um, they didn't have any attitude at all. They were our worker bees, and they did all kinds of stuff for us. It was really, really useful. Something you might not think of. The Stowers County Medical Examiner goes, oh crap, what am I going to do? So they, act to, they have a mutual aid network also. So they start bringing in help from outside counties. Yes? I'm curious, did they activate d for that? Yes, they ended up activating d You see, this thing kind of rolls out. Um, canine. So, Stones County Search and Rescue had the canine unit. Of course, they came out, but they needed way more dogs. This whole scene was hardest on the dogs because they were constantly, we had big boots on and would look for, I was standing once in the mud up to, you know, mid-shin and looked down. There's a big lawnmower blade sticking right out at my shin. These dogs were stepping out with paws. And we actually had to bring out vets, so we set up a vet clinic there for emergency care. We probably gave more emergency care to dogs. They were getting dehydrated really easily, and they would lick these pools of black water with swirly stuff in it. So they were getting sick, they had a lot of diarrhea, etc. cetera. And, um, they worked their butts off, and, and their handlers a lot of times looked like they were 60 years old. They are sitting there running up and down, and it was really tough walking on this thing. Going 50 feet could take you literally 15 minutes. Go, which is was part of my concern that this is really a dangerous thing for our rescuers. So, and of course, the heavy excavation equipment, as, as I talked about. Um, this is where the governor starts to get involved, and, and uh, we requested state aid from the county, and uh, so he uh, starts activating some FEMA units, or requesting some FEMA units. So FEMA can get involved before it actually becomes a full-on Katrina type disaster or something like that. They actually get more scalable, which is useful. Even though I made fun of the feds a lot and once I accidentally did it to their face, but I didn't know if they were <laughs> um, More fire and search and rescue personnel and, and one of the heroes there. So day four, um, this is the second or third day that I was involved. At this point, our helicopter rescue team was quite involved and getting quite stretched because we're all volunteers also. We actually had two teams of rescuers, paramedic and rescue tech out there, and they would give us the crappiest places to, to 
set up. Once was at an operating quarry, which people at the quarry nicely, they kept working, but at least they gave us a little space on our own. And then there was this old abandoned mill type thing, you know, bathroom for running water, nothing like that, but we could land our helicopter there, had a fuel truck, and uh, take off, take the, the medic and the rescue tech out, land, you know, look for people, sometimes rescue or a rescuer, that type of thing, and bring them back. At this point, we were still in rescue mode, but I think everyone was pretty clear that it was unlikely we were going to, I mean, we, we rescued a dog. Um, so this is the medical examiner's, I guess, portable war, and so they brought it up to that, that old mill and kind of left it there, and then we felt kind of ignored, and, and they think, this is my brand new truck that I just got. And they're like, can you tow this thing and move it over here? And I'm like, I don't know, I've never really done that before, but, um, so I had to experience that. Um, but they, they, they were really nice people, and they got augmented first by mutual aid, and then by FEMA, by the FEMA. And actually, the National Guard also also helped it because clearly that's a big part. That was a big part of it was the was the medical examiner part. And then the governor was um, you know, obviously Guardian One and Two from King County would just zoom overhead and bring every senator, the, the governor, lieutenant governor. They go zooming over. They didn't really do anything but look at it. But one of the big things they did is get the president to sign. Disaster. So when they, the Stafford Act actually gets um, declared, then it's declared a major disaster. This is no longer rescue stuff. This is mitigation. This is rebuilding. This just opens up a pile of federal funds to help um, both the rescue agencies and then the people that were affected by the by the slide itself. So this is a huge budgetary crunch for for agencies. And some of these little dinky volunteer fire departments have budgets that. Really small, really small. So it's a big deal. Um, the incident management team grew and started taking on FEMA. National Guard took over Air Branch by about day five or day seven, somewhere around there. And the Snohomish County Air Ops was tapped. You know, there's there's not that many full time employees. Um, we were double teaming out there for 12 to 16 hour days. The strain on the volunteers was huge, so the Army National Guard took over. The problem was is that these assets weren't the same. Um, and we had set up everything with this in mind, and I'll get to that a little bit more later. These tech rescue guys, fire guys, they stayed out there for six weeks in one form or another. Towards the end, when they were just had three or four of these huge excavators, some of them on pontoons on these lakes, looking for bodies, or pieces of bodies, etc. They would have a, a tech rescue guy sitting on the excavator, being a kind of fire EMS medical person. Just, they were just looking for anything that looked like it might be long to or be around a human being. Um, so they worked their asses off. But the command part of it um, got augmented a lot by FEMA and DNR. And actually, the National Guard helped us out a lot there, too. They couldn't do real technical stuff, but they could do a lot of the digging, looking, et cetera. So, so when, this is the road that went to, to that water in that crunched up house. It finally got, at first it was loaded up with all these big fire trucks and USAR trucks and things like that, and then gradually it starts to take shape, largely due to these guys, the National Guard. Uh, we were in and out of that stuff, as I told you, that mucky water was full of who knows what, plus septic. Um, and then it became even more toxic, and then about May 5, 6, they started saying, hey, you know what, this is actually kind of a hazmat site. So we started bringing our hazmat guys in. And they come in in their, I don't know, plastic suit type things. None of us had that, though, right? So I still got gray mud inside that nice truck from when I had to take some of the people down to the fire station to go to the bathroom and they had gray mud on. We wanted to coat them off, et cetera. But they're starting to set up these tents, um, the tents to support people. They need food. Etc. The local businesses were huge and just instantly donating stuff, tons of stuff. So they get these wooden girders and things like that from building companies, etc. The National Guard would take those out and they would make walkways through that stuff. So we finally walk without sinking up to our knees. Um, so that it was really actually useful to kind of spread out there. 
So probably 60% of these, these brown uniforms, those are all National Guard guys. Initially it was Air National Guard and the Army National Guard came in. You've got some, these guys are the, some of the tech rescue firefighter types there. So that's kind of what happened with the slide. And I had two kind of roles in it. Um, my initial role was as medical director for search and rescue, specifically the HRT. That was more involved in kind of the rescue phase and then the initial, once I took my first walk on day three onto that mud field, I'm like, this is an incredibly dangerous um, environment for these rescuers. So my, as a doctor, as a medical director, then my attention went to the rescuers. What were they going to do? They could, you know, break an ankle over fracture, you get a partial amputation. There's all kinds of things that I was going through my mind having seen the stuff that was out here and how we're going to help them. These guys weren't on little walkways. They were off in the muck. You would walk, you'd walk from log to log like that, and as I said, it would take you a long time to get 50 feet. If someone really injured themselves 50 feet away, it takes you 50 minutes to get there. If you go running over there all, you know, kind of doing the disaster, stress thing, you know, you're going to break an ankle too. And then you're one more person that's hurt, right? So there is all kinds of problems. Uh, but it started off with uh, medical direction for HRT. I won't spend a lot of time here, because at least some of you know this. Uh, our HRT is fire EMS, law enforcement, because they own the helicopter, they fly it, and then volunteer search and rescue. So all our rescue techs are mountaineers. Remember, Mount rescue, we're also EMTs. And almost all volunteers. So there's about 30 of us volunteers. And you see, if you're out there for a week and you're doing double teams, which we don't normally do, we have one rescue set and one paramedic on call on any given day, these people get worn out. Besides the fact that they're not working, the rest, the, the tech rescue fire guys are getting paid tons of overtime to be out there. The volunteers aren't, aren't working. So that can become a financial stress on them, too. Um, the other thing about HRT is it's generally a single mission, usually single patient, maybe two patient asset. We can't rig for MCI. We have to rig for it, though, which we didn't do in that first day because we didn't know. When they had it out there, they didn't know what they are headed out to. Um, the missions usually last 48 hours, maybe a little longer. Um, and this thing lasted for about two, well, really six weeks for HRT. But that first week was really labor intensive. So. Um, this is a mountain rescue type or wilderness rescue type of asset. It was, and as is the Navy's search and rescue asset, which was, they bugged out after day one, and uh, HRT stayed and was being used in a non-traditional way, which was also quite exhausting. Uh, so we have 12 to 16 hour days for two of these teams. Um, and, and finally, about, okay, I guess with day five, we were supplemented by the, the, the uh, Black Hawks and the National Guard. The problem was they weren't the same thing. They didn't have EMTs on them either, much less a paramedic on them. And their capabilities for extraction, et cetera, not the same as what we can do on Snowhawk 10. So um, weeks three to six, the HRT was on daylight standby, and that was the rescue rescuers, which we had to do at least once when I was there. Um, and this is what we ended up doing a lot of times on day about day four onwards, we would sit around a lot. Um, it was all the firefighters out there, both the volunteers and the, the uh, tech rescue guys um, doing that type of stuff. So about day four or five is when I um, really wandered down the mountain. I said, okay, Major T's not really going to do much more. They don't need my medical direction as much. I have them set up for, you know, what they're good. They know what to do if someone's injured. You go out, I've got a paramedic on board as an evaluation transport the patient. Usually what we would, we could either fly it in Snowhawk 10 or we could turn it over to fire depending on how uh, badly hurt they were. So then I uh, kind of change over to my EMS medical director hat. And at this point, all I'm worried about is my guys and my women that are out there on this, on this nasty pile and what's going to happen to them. So um, at this point, you know, by about day three or so, we had 200 firefighters from 24 and 25, and the technical rescue teams out there. So that's a lot of people that are potentially injured. We knew this, so we had an ambulance on either side, one on the west side, one on the east side. Uh, it was a medic unit, actually, ready to help. The problem was they were sitting in clothing that is completely 
completely inappropriate to walk out there, and you've got the guys out there that are injured, what's going to happen? How are you going to get them out of there? That type of thing. And quite frankly, they hadn't really thought that out. They were so focused on reading the place, looking, trying to get, because they weren't the only people out there. There were a lot of civilians out there, and you couldn't keep them away. They would just, they tried at first, and they would just go around the other side, but they were locals. This was their family and their friends and stuff like that, so we, had, we ended up working side by side with them, but it was, it was still quite a uh, nasty area, so this is the story that I talked about there. And this is what we did. These excavators would dig these big holes, these guys would hit them with rakes and rake through it and look for a body part. Well, any, any sign of uh, anything that might be a personal possession of someone, we also took that aside um, and, and those got cleaned and cataloged, etc. That was a huge process that went on for weeks itself. Um, and this is the type of stuff, again, that they were walking in. And so it was just, uh, it was a nightmare to get through up. Um, and then day four, Snowhawk 10 was um, bringing out uh, a partial body, and the tech rescue guys know how to deal with Snowhawk 10 and know helicopter rules of safety on the ground. Civilians don't. One of the relatives of this person that was found and they were trying to get out got too close. So Huey has a lot of rotor watch blew up a whole door and smacked this old guy in the head and knocked him down. So they had to get him out of there. Well, Snow 10 was hoisting remains, so took those out. So they, they had to bring them out the old-fashioned way, which was walking in this crap. We didn't have these, these nice little causeways built by the National Guard at this point. So, you know, this is another just dangerous type area. So you see they finally got out there. We actually inserted some of our paramedics by, by this day we would take them out, the second team, and we put them down on the ground near one of these landing zones, not way back at that hangar type of thing, and just in the hopes of providing more quick care and doing some ground safety. National Guard arrived day four. Um, this is kind of the hazmat was identified, and then FEMA assumed medical branch on day four, which turned out to be kind of a big deal. Medical branch at this point obviously was geared towards the rescuers. So, um, the initial plan was that we set up ourselves was we would extract using Snowhawk 10's hoist any injured rescuer. Remember, Snowhawk 10 was also taking out remains too. Um, we would take them to one of the two landing zones and turn them over for evaluation by the paramedics there, and then they would either go ground or airlift northwest. If the daring inside, they would go airlift northwest to whatever appropriate facility and identify. I, I said at this point, unless these guys are bad burned or something like that, they can go. Providence first, quicker turnaround for air, there's no reason to go all the way down to Seattle. So we had this set up, and then um, Air Branch in the morning, without her telling anyone, and Air Branch at this point was not us, it was National Guard. And they said, well, we're not going to do that medical plan, so that's, we're just not going to do it. And we're going to do our own thing. This is where the instant command system was starting to break down. So their plan was they were going to have a rig at either end, the, the Black Hawk would go and extract personnel that were injured by hoist, and then it would take them to the Arlington Airport, which is bypassing our two units that were sent there to do an actual evaluation on someone, and transfer them to Airlift Northwest. And you know, basically, even though we had someone at Medical Branch, they just kind of decided they were going to listen to Medical Branch. So I came up with the idea of, well, we just won't listen to them. So this is where I started to diverge from FEMA and the state and stuff, because that was stupid. And I realized that you needed to have some medical care at the point of potential injury. So we came up with an idea, and what they needed was bandages and tourniquets, mainly. Like, do any of you have tourniquets? No. What are you going to do if you get an arterial bleed on a leg and it takes us 45 minutes to get you out, you know, it takes 15 minutes for someone to get to you, you're going to die. So, uh, Basically, what we did is we ended up getting these what we called spike medics. We, we had to make bags or something. We asked FEMA if they could get us 200 tourniquets. And that way we'd give each one of these firefighters a tourniquet. And FEMA said no, because that would cost $20,000. So I'm like, so that's $100 a tourniquet. I'm like, 
where did you come up with that number? So I popped on Amazon, I'm like, they're 1995. <laughs> right now, we're not going to do that. So I'm like, well, screw you. So we canvassed the county for tourniquets. We didn't have 200 of them. But, you know, we, we put them with these spike medics and selected paramedics out there so they at least could save each other until we get them out. And, and uh, these guys had bandages and some splinting material, et cetera. Uh, this was on the east side. On the west side, I couldn't get to the west side, so I just left that up to whatever team had come up with. So they put a doctor out there because that's really useful. Here's the one, right? So really, this is what you need. One of the things I learned in EMS and wilderness medicine is that paramedics and EMTs are really a lot of times more useful unless you're going to be out there for a long time and that's a physician. So this is one of our spike medics with a little backpack and they would just go and stand. They would move with these guys as the excavators and the crews move around. And then week three, we're turning the bulk of it over to, um, to uh, the state and uh, federal government. So Sequeli, so uh, we recognize an HRT that we got totally strung out, basically. It's a physical strain of assets. The helicopters burned through their, their hours and had to end up going in for 100-hour maintenance, which is a week long, right in the middle of the rescue season, later that summer. So those people couldn't be rescued, et cetera. Uh, it did do a lot for HRT with respect to public, public uh, awareness because we were undergoing some real budget cuts and we're going to go away, actually, when this happened. Um, so one of the things we recognized some staffing limits, we did some NCI type packs, things like that, so we could respond to ourselves a little bit more vigorously. County fire and EMS agencies, huge budget strings, huge budget strings. The amount of overtime. Think of all those rescue techs that are up on that pile for weeks and weeks. They had to be backfilled by people getting overtime. Firefighters, especially firefighter paramedics in this neck of the country, are paid a lot. A lot. What a lot. <laughs> like, some of them make as much as a pediatrician does. So it's it's impressive. And then if you get 50% more because it's overtime, you can see it was a strain on these. So they did the Stafford Act. This was huge. They'll pay 75%. The Washington State kicks in 12.5%. The county still took a huge multi-million dollar hit. But it, and we would have done it anyway. But it wasn't as much of a disaster. And the other thing that we really had to, to worry about was critical incident stress. These guys would be out there for 12 hours a day, they'd go home, sleep, get up, and go out for another 12 hours a day. They did it for, after about a week or 10 days, I told their fire chiefs to pull them off. Let the National Guard do it for a while. Get them out. They're getting too emotionally enmeshed with the civilians. They're working side by side, but they got to know these people, family. And, um, you know, they, 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 they just needed to be pulled out, which, of course, pissed them off, and they knew they get it right away, but um, <laughs> they did okay in the end. So, um, so that's... It's in a nutshell, and I've still got it. Yeah, that's great. So, any, any questions for you on? Is there about the OSO slide or EMS management? So, in the aftermath, the Snohomish County have a plan of action. We established an emergency manager for a potential round two. Well, we already had emergency managers. So, but the emergency managers aren't. As I said, they're not really useful until like at least 12 hours in, maybe 24. It takes a while for that to gear up. So your initial emergency management is done by that that fire captain or fire chief, county chief, whatever level is highest, um, to set up that type of command. Some of the stuff we pulled out of it, the, the fire was pretty well set for this. Um, HRT took some take-home points. Uh, EMS side of the fire rescue equation, um, that was, a, we did learn some stuff from that. As a matter of fact, so the MPD, medical program director, he's the head of EMS, and Dr. Cooper, it took over for me in 2012, was around for this. He was working down at um, the medical center here at the time. So he ended up coming up with like six medical students uh, would go out here to, to visit. And he was driving all over the place, et cetera. But we did identify some stuff. Um, from our end that we're, we're learning lessons. And you will get that from any kind of thing. The Maryville Pilchuck thing that happened not too long after this, that shooting, um, you know, we're always learning something from it. One of the biggest things is communication coordination. Like, there was no reason for all, for Airlift Northwest to be gone as long as it was, taking people to Harborview. They didn't need to go to Harborview. Um, they needed a medical screening and then someone, it could be a paramedic, to apply some brains and say, okay, where do you need to go? Because they know the capabilities. And 
um, you know, and Providence is huge, 79 beds in that ER. They can take a lot of stuff. And then even transfer from there down to Harborview is necessary. That's the way your system should work. You say Harborview for when you need Harborview. So I'm curious when you're talking about that. Was there a plan in place for um, prior to the incident? Was there a plan in place for how to, I guess, uh, triage the sets and decide if there were a large MCI, where to send people automatically? Or was that plan developed out of those so? No, it was around and it was a crappy plan. Let's see, when I became MPD, we had a thick plan for MCIs. And, but you know, there's a bunch of different fire agencies and fire chiefs, right? So a bunch of chiefs running around. And so that plan somehow got shelved, and then we took King County's MCI plan, which is really scanty, and used a little whiteout in some areas, and then wrote in, you know, Omega County, you know, <laughs> and still, it, you know, the, the system worked okay, because dispatch and a few intelligent chiefs, like, like Eric Andrews, who's District 7 and District 26 that I worked for, um, you know, can direct some assets, and dispatch knows how to direct ass uh, assets. But what happened, particularly from, this is the end where the doctors get involved, is like, where do these patients go? They just did it by habit at that point. And this is a way north part, rural part of the county, so like in Everett, or for instance in Marysville Pilchuck, when those kids got shot, those, Marysville's right next to Everett, so they knew what the capabilities were, and they took those, and they ground was fast, and boom, they had them down at, at Providence within minutes. There, there was also some controversy at that, though, because yeah. there, was, there was some thought that a couple of those people should have gone directly to Harborview. Yeah. And there was a lot of discussion afterwards about the appropriate decision. Well, and there was, so, so, too, what happened was, when this happened, um, mm -hmm. the Seattle Times and a bunch of news agencies went camped out at Harborview. And so they're all sitting around waiting for it. And but literally it would take a lot more time to put someone on a helicopter, fly them down, put them in the ambulance, take them on the corner, get them in the ER type of thing. It, so, you know, the, the 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 real criticism was your pediatric trauma capabilities for neurosurgery or something like that. Um, but um, anyway. There was an expectation that all these people would be coming down from that shooting to Harborview. They didn't show up, and then the criticism just started. The second guess was supposed to come on, too, which was kind of inappropriate. But um, anyway, the, but it, you know, when I became uh, MPD in 2005, you, they had a real low threshold for calling Airlift Northwest for stuff, and then say they'd give them to Airlift and say, OK, see ya. I'm not involved anymore. Whereas Airlift is perfectly happy to take the patient wherever you tell them to take the patient. So one of the things that came out of this was the hospital control, because it DMCC, the Designated Mental Medical Control Center, um, which is the hospital's responsibility. They're in contact with the command at the medical branch, specifically the, the transport person, if it's big enough to involve that. They make a decision where they get hospital makes that decision, they're in contact with the other ones, got a doc there, and they can say, okay, this person needs to go to Harborview, send that one to Harborview. Bring these ones here, send that one to St. Joe's in Bellingham, or to Skagit, or you know, Evergreen, whatever. So that um, that did come out of that, and, and continued to kind of mature out of that, too. So, and this is not, this is not um, unique to Snohomish County. This is everywhere in the country. I mean, and it still happens. Even 13, 14 years after 9-11, things like this can still happen, obviously. Right? So um, you, you kind of have to go through one of these things to really say, oh, your tabletop exercises just don't quite do it. Or even your real-time event tech. There's nothing like doing something like this to learn about what you need to do and how you use your assets to so, you know, that's, that did come out of it. I think that was more, that was more kind of on the medical direction side, the hospital side, things like that. In my opinion, fire responded kind of like they should. They're used to doing mutual aid. They're used to upscaling stuff. That's what they do, and that's what they did. Um, I don't think you could have made that first eight hours run any differently. Uh, you could have run worse if 
Snowhawk 10 wasn't already spinning up and had people there because we respond to wilderness medicine type stuff, we'll get there 9, 12 hours after the injury occurs. That's normal. We're, you know, supposed to be 30 minutes away from when the call goes out, but we get there, we, you know, we don't go like firefighters do. Um, you know, that's not appropriate for that type of, that, that asset. It's too dangerous. You don't do stuff all willy-nilly, you know, running around with your chicken with head cut off and everything. If you do helicopter rescue, you're going to die. Someone's going to make a mistake. They fall out, helicopter crashes, something like that. No one's, no rescue is worth losing your, your personnel. So, you know, that was kind of a unique use of HRT as far as fire winds. You know, that's what's going to happen. The local fire and police are going to go in. And so they're not going to be able to set up command. Their command will be a radio and a truck for the deputy who didn't go in or something like that until backup arrives from surrounding fire agencies. And that's what happened. So I think that that's, that, that went as I would expect. Is there any discussion with the feds afterwards about how they sort of just like did their own thing? I mean, I guess uh, I yeah, I get a little bit. I don't, at that point, I was just like, now this, really, this, this wore me out, too. I'm a little PTSD-ish myself, you know, after seeing dead little kids brought out and things like that. So, I, you know, I let the, this was a multi-huge agency type of thing, and doctor, I let, let that up to go. But you can't keep the federal government. Yeah, well, we were always taught in the incident management, but it's like it's so important to just sort of like follow the plan and do yeah. exactly what the plan says. And so yeah. it seems like, but you, the so that was an interesting point to me is that they, they these that one example I gave up there with the plan that I ignored, right? Was they came up with a plan that wasn't using what was in place, and it was it was being decided by people who who didn't know they didn't know what was going on in the ground. So, you know, we tweaked it for that. Part of the, and I don't want to diss the National Guard, but, um, you know, their hoist capabilities weren't up to snuff. For instance, they were trying to hoist out a lead with the family watching, and they couldn't do it. The rotor wash plus the lead would roll off the hill. They were trying to put out this thing called a skid, which would roll out plastic thing. They wouldn't let any of the tech rescue firefighters help, and they're used to working on helicopters. They work with us. So they made them stand around in a circle and watch. And it, it was just, it didn't come out well at all. And the, part of the reason why I changed that plan, and I'm sure I can be criticized for it. I never did, but I'm sure I can be criticized for it. But these, these firefighters and paramedics and chiefs came up to me and said, I don't want to put any of live bodies on that list. And because they watched us, and we, that's what we do is hoisting. We learned from the best, which is the U.S. Coast Guard. And hoisting is very dangerous. And so they watched us do it for four days, five days. And then they watched the National Guard take over, and they were doing non-live stuff. And it was, it was a disaster. And since, we actually, they came to us and said, we need to train. And we did. We trained with them, and we trained with them ongoing. You know, because they're an asset that we need, right? I mean, Swamp 10 and Guardian, Guardian now does more stuff like we do. We can't do it to stay. So you need to have that multi-layer backup, and the feds are the next backup. So they, they, that's why I did that. Because they said, I don't want to be on that point. I agree. So. Um, amongst all the agencies, has communication, like, increased for the better after this has happened? Or, like, training? Yes. Yeah. So well, so... so that um, after 9-11, they practiced communications, and, and, and I think the communications was pretty good. What we found was we couldn't use the radios nearly as much as we wanted to. We were using, we were texting each other. You know, I want to talk to Chad Berg, and he's over, you know, tenth of a mile away, but I would text him and said, leave the radio for the command guys, because there weren't enough channels, especially out there. There's fewer channels than System. So that actually that actually went okay. I think that the communication between the disaster scene and the hospital network needed to be improved. I think that's progressed. It doesn't 
doesn't mean it's going to run great, but it will run better. So it did occur to you know to the people at Providence that gosh, we need to do a better job of this. Perhaps we can get home soon. So we're after seven, so I just want to be respectful of everybody's time. So Ron will hang around for a little bit afterwards if you have additional questions, but otherwise let's give him a round of applause. Did it take?